thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, I have a couple of questions, or more observations to put to you, questions as well. Um, but the first one, I'll just make an observation on leaders' questions today in the Law Chamber about an hour or two ago. Um, I thought it was interesting that Taoiseach sought to reach across the floor and seek support from the opposition and indeed the wider Dáil for the plan. Um, I just thought it was ironic given the I suppose, uh, lack of interest that Taoiseach had in Dáil support or, or Dáil majorities or anything else uh, a year ago when uh, my party introduced a, a motion to review the National Broadband Plan, which was passed by majority votes in the Dáil. Uh, but regardless, uh, it was completely ignored by the Taoiseach and indeed the government. Um, despite constitutional constraints, such as Article 28.4.1 of the Constitution, uh, which says, of course, that the government will be responsible to the Dáil. Um, but that has been flagrantly, uh, I suppose, violated many, many times in the current Dáil. So I suppose plus a change. Um, but on the, on the plan itself, um, the, I'm going to take a more fundamental approach to, to querying the plan um, and, and talk about the plan. And if we go back to basics, the fundamentals of the National Broadband Plan, the, the basic premise behind it is, if I understand it correctly, I think I do, is that there are many areas, primarily but not all, not exclusively in rural Ireland, which are simply unviable to the private sector. So broadband will not be delivered through the private sector because it's too difficult to do so, and it's commercially unviable. And therefore, as a state or as a government or maybe as a, an Oireachtas, we're making a decision to subsidise somebody to go in and do it. So it can, can be done for profit. We're going to pay so much, you're going to do it as a state subsidy. It's a state subsidy, subsidy for the public good, and that's fine. And we do that in lots of different areas, like public transport and healthcare and everything else, and, and it's certainly a good idea. But if we flip around and say, well, why in this case do we need to do subsidy? And why are these areas impenetrable in the first place? So why is it that these are commercially unviable? Why is it that the private sector is actually delivering to some areas, but not to other areas? Uh, I suppose that's the where I would actually start, so I'd actually put the question on its head. Um, and we've already seen once in the lifetime of the current plan uh, where we had 340,000 houses, uh, obviously 300,000 houses, which were considered unviable two years ago, um, are suddenly viable. And I suppose to an extent I'm living proof, because I live in a house which now enjoys 300 megabits per second uh, fibre broadband, uh, which two years ago was amber, um, and then became light blue, and then became commercial, and hey presto, I have it, and I'm paying uh, for the privilege, and I'm happy to do so. So, when I was a councillor, long before I was in, in, in this chamber, um, I was trying to get rural broadband rolled out of County Kildare, and it's, it's a nationwide example, so it's, it's, it's a local example, but it carries across the, the country. Um, and I met the broadband providers, and I asked them this question. I said, well, why is it that areas of my constituency, uh, rural areas uh, and other areas, uh, are not being served by your services? What is the problem? Why can't you get in? Why don't you roll it out? Uh, people are there more than uh, willing to go and pay for the service, uh, even pay a little premium if they had to. Um, and I got a number of interesting answers. Uh, lack of planning consistency, uh, different planning frameworks across different local area plans, across different county development plans, uh, lack of economies of scale. Uh, some of that was arising from the fact that there were inconsistencies in planning overhead, regulatory overheads, uh, legacy frameworks. Uh, the lack of availability in many cases uh, of access to state sites, things like Quilter, OPW, um, other state sites, and um, the fact that, for instance, the TII, uh, formerly the NTA, uh, it actually emerged that it was cheaper. If you wanted to dig up a road, uh, and of course the great bane of many people's lives is when the road is dug up again and again and again, but, and I said, why do you go in and dig up the road again and lay a new ducting, and lay a new cable, when you're going to do you know, any utility actually, but a fibre in this case? And this is actually, based on the rates that deeper mandates TI to charge, it's actually cheaper to dig up the road yourself than it is to actually lease it from, from, from the TII. Um, so all kinds of anomalies came out of these discussions. Very, very useful uh, in terms of me understanding the, the process of why the private sector wasn't delivering to these areas. Um, and of course, many of these issues were also mirrored in the task forces, the many task forces. We know we've had at least a decade of promises uh, on broadband, uh, all to date of which should be missed uh, and abandoned and moved on or re rescheduled. Um, but many th we've also had, I think, at least three different task forces reporting in, again, uh, summarising the issues, consolidating the issues and saying why is the private sector not able or not willing or not viable to get into these areas. So we have the proof in the pudding, we have it in, in many task forces uh, and we have it uh, from the horse of mouth as it were, from the robot providers. So I suppose the, the, the position is this, and actually the Sunday Business Post quite usefully wrote about this um, at the weekend, and we've heard already the likes of Imagine going into 5G, the likes of Air going into the 300,000 houses, and I appreciate this debate about the technology and that fibre, and I agree fibre is of course the best from laws of physics, um, but we can deliver fibre, we can deliver mass, we can deliver 5G, we can deliver multiple technologies, including fibre, 
faster, easier uh, if we enable the private sector to get in there by reforming how we do our planning, and by reforming the frameworks around it, and by reforming how they operate. We won't get to 540,000 houses. It's very unlikely we might eventually. But it's very unlikely we would. But could we get to 500,000? Could we get to 450? Could we get to 430? Could our 3 billion become 2.75? Or could it become 2.5? If we chip away, if we actually look at the problems, rather than trying to throw in a state subsidy and throw 3 billion at the problem and try, try to make it go away, if we actually went to the root cause uh, and said, well, maybe we can do, do this, maybe if we actually make it easier, maybe if we incentivize the private sector, not by any kind of subsidy or, or, or state handout, but by actually saying, let's tackle the problems that make it more difficult for you to move to go into these places. Let's tackle the reason that it's commercially unviable. Let's tackle the reason that the planning framework... I was up uh, on the hill at Cotille uh, two weeks ago on a local election canvas. Three counties meet at that point, Dublin, Kildare and Wicklow. For a provider to put a mass on that hill, they could feasibly be uh, engaged with three different local authorities, which could have three different local area plans, which could have three different planning frameworks, uh, for, for, you know, if they were to try and put, a, say, for example, a 5G or even a fibre infrastructure on that hill. Um, if they go, as I said earlier, to go and rent a ducting from the N7 a mile down the road from it, um, they might have to find it which is actually cheaper to go in and do it themselves, uh, rather than trying to lease it from, from the state. Where do we go with all this? Well, helpfully, here's one I made earlier. Here is legislation I published in 2017, almost two years ago from this date, uh, which actually enables all of these things, takes these issues, takes these anomalies, and um, includes such provisions as a new planning permission uh, for a new build to have ducting from the, uh, from the cartilage of the house back to the road. Uh, it includes things like uh, consistencies and planning frameworks. It includes things like access to state sites, state properties. It also includes common sense things, I think, which deliver economies of scale, but also protect uh, communities and the environment, such as if a, if a mast is up on the top of a hill, that the provider going in after them doesn't put in another mast, but is actually mandated to reuse the existing infrastructure. And it provides free use of infrastructure, be it public, be it private. Uh, but once it, the cable is laid, once the mast goes in, it's reused, it's there forevermore. Uh, and pretty much a, uh, a collection of items which would make it easier. It wouldn't solve the problem, it's not a silver bullet. But it would, solve, it would make it a lot easier for the private sector to penetrate to live into these areas. Uh, and again, as I say, the 3 billion may become 2.5 billion, the 540,000 might become 440, etc. If, if the government had adopted this legislation when it was published two years ago, we might be in a better position now. It can travel in parallel with the plan. Uh, there's nothing, they're, they're not in any way competing or exclusive, they're actually complementary. But I do believe the price tag comes down with every step of the way. So, Minister, I put it to you, will you support this legislation, which is already before the Oireachtas, which is already in the system, which I believe would be complementary and parallel to, to all this? And it's also you could consider a plan B, because if the plan fails, um, as it has unfortunately for the last decade, this may allow greater private sector take-up, okay, and this will allow more houses more quickly get access thank to you. broadband without the recourse to three billion state subsidy. Okay, thank you. I'm going to bring in the minister. Yeah, maybe I, I first just on the the um, the model that we use, and then bring in um, Minister Say Sean Canny, who who is um, has chaired the broadband uh, the mobile and broadband uh, task force. But the, the model that we decided to go for was to have a competitive tender to seek to achieve universal access. Uh, and we were open as to what technology would deliver that and how that could best be done. And interestingly, all three of those who came in were, came in with a fibre solution. And that's why we, um, the fibre has become the, the, the dominant, uh, has become the, the winner of this process. There wasn't, uh, no, none were coming in with the alternative, uh, you know, uh, approaches. So this, this has proved to be the most cost-effective way of of achieving uh, that uh, goal. Of course, I admit if you uh, w no, don't want to achieve that goal, uh, but I think what the Oireachtas wants, and certainly it's what I believe is necessary, is that we do get every home has access to a technology that's future-proofed. Uh, you know, mixing and matching and hoping over time it would work out uh, was not the approach we, we, we ad adopted. Uh, Sean has done a lot of work on exactly those sort of issues of, of how the practical obstacles can be uh, removed, and maybe um, Sean would deal with that. Yeah, I think you, Mr. And I the point you made. It's not about competing technologies. Even let it be fibre is the technology, and I agree completely. Of course, that's the, the, the uh, primary technology that can be used. It's about how even be it, be it fibre. It's how we get that faster, cheaper, quicker out to people and do it in the current day without the need for any kind of state subsidy. Thanks, Minister. Okay.